Welcome to the Special Senses Lecture. Um, we're going to first talk a little bit about the uh, general characteristics of special senses. We will cover a bit of anatomy, but we're really going to focus on the mechanisms of some of the special senses towards the end of this PowerPoint. Those will be what's really emphasized on your next exam. So the types of receptors we have um, in our body in terms of sensory receptors are going to include chemoreceptors, nociceptors, thermoreceptors, mechanoreceptors, and photoreceptors. Chemoreceptors, like the prefix states chemo, they detect chemicals like odors or flavors. Nociceptors are found everywhere in your body as well and detect pain. Thermoreceptors, thermo means like a thermometer, like temperature changes, heat changes. These guys detect temperature changes around your body. Mechanoreceptors are mechanically sense receptors. These guys measure pressure changes, um, like touch, feel, bending, stretching, and these ones um, are not really considered a special sense, but we're going to see these types of receptors in hearing. Then you have photoreceptors, and photo means light, and the only place humans have these is in their eyes. So with these, we're able to sense things like pain, taste, sight, smell, and hearing. These receptors can be found in a few different places. Um, they can be externally, so exteroceptors, which sense things outside of your body in the environment. Interoreceptors, which sense things internally, like stomach pain, cramps, fullness, the sensation to urinate. And proprioception. These ones are found in your muscles and your tendons, and they let you know how much you've stretched out your um, peripheral body, and they give you a sense of your position in your surrounding space. This is one of the first uh, senses you lose after drinking alcohol, which is why a lot of people who have drank alcohol uh, lose their sense of balance. Um, they're not able to walk up or down stairs properly because they're not able to understand how far to stretch out their arms to hold onto the handrail, how large of a step to take to get from one step to another. They oftentimes over or underestimate it um, because those receptors don't work very well. So the first one we're going to cover, and this isn't a super in-depth mechanism, but it's enough that it's going to get the gist of things. Um, in terms of pain, how you sense pain. Pain is detected by nociceptors. They're found internally and externally. So here you see on the skin, you have the nerve ending, and you've got nociceptors here with a pin pricking the skin. The nociceptor will detect that pain, send it through a neuron to go into the spinal cord, up the spinal cord to the brain, and it'll say, hey brain, we just sensed a pin pricking. And the brain will say, well, that's not a sense that I like. That actually hurt me. So the brain will send an outgoing signal back down the spinal cord and to the muscle that's in the area of this skin. And the muscle will contract, pulling, let's say, the hand out of the way of the pin. So it's all a matter of sensing things, interpreting them in the brain, and sending an outgoing reaction to get your body out of that line of fire or wherever the pain is coming from. Now, internal pain is detected a bit differently. Internal pain, um, in terms of maybe tearing a tissue internally, having a GI bleed, having an ulcer, cramps, all of these are sensed again by nociceptors. But in this case, they're sensed because damaged tissue releases chemicals, and those chemicals bind to the nociceptors. What's very specific about internal pain is that internal pain is only sensed when the receptor binds to pain chemicals. Bradykinin, serotonin, and histamine are three chemicals that can be secreted by damaged cells that bind to nociceptors that get sent to the brain to tell the brain, hey, we're binding pain chemicals in this region that must mean something is wrong, and the brain can then respond to it. Now, pain isn't always detected from where it's actually coming from. If you've ever heard um, people talk about men having heart attacks, 
When men have heart attacks, where do they feel the pain other than their chest? Well, they feel it in their left shoulder and arm region. Well, why would you feel it here if your heart is in the middle here? This is called referred pain. And what I really want you to know is this sentence here. Neural pathways converge. When two neurons, let's say one from the heart and one from the arm, send signals to the spinal cord, they converge onto one center in the spinal cord. When they converge, this center brings those signals together and sends a single signal up to the thalamus, which is in the brain, if you remember this from anatomy. Now, the brain does get the signal of pain, but the brain doesn't know. Did that pain signal come from the heart? Or did it come from the arm? Because the brain is unable to differentiate where the signal originated from, um, it could easily miscommunicate the location of the pain to your brain. This is called referred pain, and again, it's because two neurons converge onto one in the spinal cord. You do not need to memorize this illustration, but it does show you some examples of referred pain. And um, everything in red is going to be sensed together. So from the heart down to the left arm, armpit, and down almost to your um, wrist region, all this is detected together. Another really cool one is your stomach and your lungs and diaphragm. These two converge together. The liver gallbladder, when it hurts, it might hurt your upper right neck region. Um, anything that's in the lower pelvic region might also hurt the medial femoral region. And the ureter pain can also sometimes be sensed by the arms. All of these regions do have converging neurons. So if you go to the doctor and you say, hey, my upper neck on the right side is hurting, if the doctor knows about referred pain, they'll be like, hey, you know what? The pain might be from here, but it might be also from your liver and gallbladder region. So kind of interesting to um, see that pain doesn't always come from where you think it's coming from. So this takes us to the next topic of analgesics. And analgesics um, could be either drugs that you take externally or they can be produced internally. And the point of an analgesic is to block the pain pathway. So um, internal analgesics um, are naturally produced in your body and they can be produced when you're in a very, very good mood. And we'll talk about that in the next uh, mechanism slide. The external analgesics are things like opioids and heroin. And um, their real main goal is to block the nociceptor pathway to prevent the signals from pain uh, from getting to your brain. Now, does this mean that the um, instigator of pain has also gone away? No, it doesn't. The pain-causing um, chemical and the pain-causing agent is still present, but the signal to the brain is getting blocked. So with that being said, let's go through this pathway. Please make sure you spend time on this pathway, and I specifically want you to know where these pathways are taking place. For example, this orange bubble is the spinal cord. These green bubbles are both um, in the brain, as is the pink one, as is the red one. So all of these are in the brain, the orange is in the spinal cord. So before we begin this pathway, I wanna bring you right over here to our little legend. Green little dots are called substance P. These are going to be our um, pain signaling chemicals. Uh, in purple, you have serotonin, and in red, you have enkephalins. So if we go through this pathway, you'll see that if you put your finger over a flame, the flame damages the cells. Those cells secrete um, chemicals that bind to the nociceptors to send the signal to the spinal cord. When the signal goes to the spinal cord, it releases something called substance P. When you think of the letter P, think of pain. So substance P has a green plus sign next to it. That means it's upregulating this whole pain pathway. So substance P goes into the spinal cord and sprinkles onto the next neuron. 
The next neuron will go up the spinal cord and into the thalamus. The thalamus will then send the signal up to the cerebral cortex, and this right here is really where you consciously interpret pain. When your cortex says, ouch, that hurts, it then says, you know what? I don't like that signal, and it's going to send a signal back to your finger to move the finger out of the way. But right now, we don't want to look at the reaction um, pathway. We're trying to see how analgesics work in the pain pathway. So once the cortex decides that there's pain, it'll send a signal down the midbrain to the medulla, and the medulla oblongata has the ability to send signals that have serotonin in them into the spinal cord again. The serotonin is in purple here. That serotonin will send a signal to the next neuron, which will then secrete enkephalins. Enkephalins have a red minus sign next to it. This means it's going to downregulate this neuron. Essentially what that means is it's going to block the function of the neuron. So when enkephalins are released in the spinal cord, it causes this whole system to stop sending more signal up to the brain so that your brain can't interpret that you are in pain. Now, if I may, serotonin is secreted when people are in very good moods or when they're working out. The more serotonin you secrete, the more you signal secretion of the enkephalins, and the more enkephalin you secrete, the more you block the pain pathway. This is why when people are happy and in good moods, they tend to feel pain at a much lower rate. So again, we have substance P, sending the signal to the brain, going back down to the spinal cord to release serotonin, which will signal release of enkephalin, which acts as an analgesic, and it downregulates the pain signal. So again, this whole pathway is the analgesic pathway. Everything that I talked about is written in the steps. Please read the steps if you do need more details. Now, we're going to go one by one through each of the uh, special senses, and I'm going to spend time talking about the characteristics, and then we'll go into the very uh, detailed mechanisms. The first one is the taste sensation. And just like smell, taste is a chemical sense. Whenever you taste something, you're tasting the chemicals from the food binding to your taste buds. There are five basic sensations, and that's sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. In our mechanisms, we're going to go through these first four. Sweet sensations are created by chemicals like sugars, saccharins, alcohols, and amino acids. Salt is created by metal ions like sodium and potassium. Sour is created by hydrogen ions, so H plus ions in the foods will make it taste sour. And bitter is created by alkaloids, and um, we'll just call these bitter molecules. We're not going to go into the chemistry of alkaloids or quinine. Let's start with a big picture and we'll move smaller and smaller into the tiny little receptors. So we'll start here at your tongue. On your tongue you have little dots. These little dots as well as these big dots are called papilla. Each of these papilla houses taste buds on them that are connected by a neuron that leave the back of your taste bud, converge, go to your brain and signal the brain as to what kind of chemical bound. Now when you eat something, it dissolves in your saliva. The saliva comes down into these little crevices on the right and left side that you see here. In reality, it's all around the circumference of the papilla. When the saliva mixed with the chemicals goes down into these little crevices, we'll take a closer look here, it binds to these little hairs. And on these little hairs are these little receptors. So the chemicals bind to these chemoreceptors. They send a signal through these cells into the neuron. The neuron goes to the brain and tells your brain, hey, we just bound a lot of H plus molecules, which means we're eating something sour. So they're able to detect what kind of chemicals they're binding to, and you have different receptors for each of the different chemicals. Where we're going to focus on for this mechanism is going to be at the receptor site. Now, just to review a little bit of anatomy, you have four different types of papilla. Filiform papilla, these are the ones that have no taste buds on them. 
Their main purpose is just for texture sensation. Then you have foliate papilla, and the foliate papilla are going to be in the sides of the tongue here and here. These guys continue developing until a child is about the age of five. Then you have fungi form papilla, which are found all along the body of the tongue. There's about two to three taste buds per papilla. But then these really big ones, we call these circumvalate papilla. These guys are huge. Each of these have about 250 taste buds on them. They're massive. So the, the crux of like the taste sensation happens at the base of the tongue that's in the back. So this is where we go into the details. Um, go through this slow. Make sure you pay attention the first time I go through it. Go through it then a second time and write your notes on it. Um, and then go through it a third time again just to reinforce those notes. So we're going to go through four different types of taste reception. Sweet, bitter, sour, and salty. These two are probably the most complex ones. But the good news is you know every single protein and transporter in these receptors already. So the sweet one starts with just a basic sweet molecule. We'll call it a sugar, maybe a glucose. The sweet molecule binds to this receptor. Just so you know, this is a G protein couple receptor, those G PCRs we talked about. When the sweet molecule binds to the receptor, it causes a structural change in this G protein. Make sure you know the name of this G protein as gustusin. Okay, I'm going to give you a few names and I'll circle the ones that are really important. So gustusin is just the specific name of this particular G protein. If you recall, the G protein then goes and activates adenyl cyclase. This is written as adenylate cyclase. Just know that adenyl cyclase and adenylate cyclase, they're interchangeable. They're the same thing. And what did you know that adenyl cyclase does? Well, it takes ATP and it converts it into CAMP. Then CAMP activates protein kinases, and you know the word kinase. Kinase means we're phosphorylating something. This protein kinase will add a phosphate group, this is the chemical formula of a phosphate group, to potassium channels, closing them. Normally, potassium is allowed to leak out of a cell, but if we close them, potassium starts building up in the cell. A lot of them start building up in the cell. Now, what charge does potassium have on it? It has a positive charge. So if you force potassiums to stay in the cell and they start building up and you end up having all of these positive charges, what's going to happen to the voltage of this cell overall? Well, the voltage is going to go up. Using terms of voltage, what do you call it when a cell increases in voltage? So you have the baseline, and what do you call it when it goes up in voltage? It is called depolarization. So because the kinase phosphorylated the potassium channel, it caused the potassium channel to close. Potassiums now stay inside, and they start building up slowly. As they build up, the positive charges build up in the cell. That causes depolarization of the cell. When the cell depolarizes, that causes voltage-gated calcium channels. Write that down next to this. Voltage-gated calcium channels will become activated. They open. And as you know, the outside of a cell has a lot more calcium than the inside of the cell. So if you open a door to calcium, by diffusion, calcium is going to want to move into the cell. So the high voltage opens up voltage-gated calcium channels, allowing calcium to enter. And from the insulin example that we went over, calcium causes vesicles to do exocytosis. These are signaling chemicals that send their signal to the neuron. That neuron sends the signal to your brain. So make sure you go over this as many times as needed. Here's the bitter sensation. The bitter sensation has two different receptors it can work through, depending on what kind of bitter molecules you have. 
Um, quinines can cause this. Other bitter chemicals can cause this as well. And I don't need you to, to distinguish what kind of bitter molecule it is. I just need you to learn the two pathways. If both molecules are present, both pathways can happen at the same time. If only one or another is present in the food that you're eating, one or another can happen. So let's look at the left side first. The bitter molecule has the ability to straight up bind to and block potassium channels. The same thing is going to happen here. Potassium stays in the cell and starts building up in the cell, which means what's going to happen to the voltage of the cell? It's going to depolarize, causing voltage-gated calcium channels to open, calcium enters, and calcium causes exocytosis of vesicles onto the neuron. So simple two-step process here. Right side is a bit more complex. This has a G protein couple receptor system happening again, just like the sweet one, but we have a little bit of a different name here. The bitter molecule binds to the receptor. The receptor activates the G protein. This one is called transducin. Remember that one was called gustucin? So transducin is this G protein. The G protein will then activate phospholipase C. Do you remember from the last um, module, this was PLC. Phospholipase C takes these membrane phospholipids and it breaks them down into IP3 and DAG. DAG we're not going to talk about at all on this mechanism, henceforth it's not written here. So the phospholipase C is an enzyme in the membrane that breaks down a few uh, phospholipids in the membrane into DAG and IP3. We want to focus on this IP3. IP3, just like you learned in the last module, goes to the ER, opens up ligand-gated calcium channels because IP3 binds to the calcium channel, let's just say right here, opens it, and in the ER here, there's a ton of calcium, a lot of calcium. And remember, the inside of the cell doesn't have a whole lot. So if you're opening a compartment that stores a ton of calcium, calcium is naturally going to want to leave that compartment and go into the cytoplasm where there's not a whole lot of calcium. Again, same thing is going to happen. The calcium causes exocytosis of the chemicals onto the uh, neuron, and that will go to your brain. So sweet and bitter. These are the two most complex ones. Now, the next two are much more simple. We'll start with sour. Remember that if you eat something sour, it has high amounts of protons in it. That is the chemical that makes the food taste sour to you. Protons block potassium channels. When you block the potassium channel, potassium stays in the cell, voltage goes up, opens up voltage-gated calcium channels, calcium enters, and causes exocytosis to signal the neuron to send the signal to the brain. That's it, no more than that. The salty one, salty foods have a lot of sodium in them. Sodium in your saliva, and remember the saliva is outside of the taste bud here. We're gonna call all this saliva. In saliva, you have pretty low amounts of sodium. So when you eat something that has high sodium in it, the amount of sodium in the saliva is going to naturally go up because the food that you eat dissolves in the saliva. It just happens while you're chewing naturally. Imagine a high amount of saliva out here now and low amounts of sodium on the inside. Because remember, naturally, sodium is found high outside of a cell and low inside of a cell. So with that being said, again, I'm going to remind you that this high sodium concentration is extracellular fluid. We're right now talking about taste buds that are in saliva, not extracellular fluid. So in this case, the sodium is pretty low on the outside of a cell. So whatever salty foods you eat is going to naturally cause more sodium to dissolve in your saliva. And because sodium will be high out here and naturally low inside of your cells, sodium will diffuse 
into the cell. And again, what charge does sodium have on it? Positive charge. So the voltage will go up. That'll cause opening of voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium will enter the cell, and that calcium will cause exocytosis of the signaling chemical to eventually go to your brain. So if you're seeing some commonalities between this, I think the one big commonality is the idea that calcium is required for exocytosis and that the calcium channels and the membranes of these guys, so you've got one here, you've got one here, you have it here, you have it here. They're voltage-gated calcium channels. I didn't point to this one because this one is a ligand-gated one. But these are the mechanisms, the four that I need you to go through step by step and make sure you understand the process of binding of the chemical and the process of the signal transduction in each of the taste buds for each of the four taste sensations.